Dateline, Salt Lake Tribune, December 14th, 1890. Quote, first annual floral exhibition of plants and designs on Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, December 15th, 16th, and 17th at Kramer's, the most complete floral establishment in the city. I promise you will be pleased with the handsome display. Everybody come. Admission, 25 cents. Busby's Avenue, one and one-fourth blocks east of Main Street between 2nd and 3rd South. End quote. I'm Wendy. I'm Chris. And this is Demolish Salt Lake and the story of the Kramer House. Hello and welcome to episode 28. There's something a little different about this episode. What do you think it is, Chris? I think it's me. I think it's you too. (laughs) Please join me in welcoming Chris Jensen as the new co-host of the podcast. Chris, do you want to introduce yourself to the fine folks? Yeah, I'm Chris Jensen. I'm a local preservationist, finishing my master's degree in historic preservation through Goucher College. Great college, by the way, if you want to go there. Um, And I'm just excited for this opportunity to help tell the story of historic places in Utah. Yes, and I'm excited to have you on board. So you might be thinking, why did I bring on a co-host? And um, it's because it helps to sustain the podcast. (laughs) This is a lot of work for me to do all on my own. And with Chris's knowledge and love and interest in historic buildings and historic preservation, it was a really good fit to bring him on and help elevate some of the conversations and the subjects that we will talk about on the podcast. Yeah, I think it'll be really great. We'll expand our horizons a bit, and we'll talk about things we haven't talked about in the past and um, really explain to people what preservation is. It's not just old buildings. Right. We have, a, we have a lot more to talk about, and with you on board, we can do that, and I'm excited for that. Looking forward to it. All right. So should we talk about Kramer House? Yes. Okay, so this episode is not about a demolished building, but instead one that stood, one that has stood strong while the majority of all the buildings around it are long gone. The Kramer House has been in the news lately as it's part of a new development of affordable housing called the Aster. But before we talk about its future, because yay, it has a future, let's talk about its past. So Christopher Kramer was born in Denmark in 1852. He converted to Mormonism and came to Utah in the 1860s. He settled in Ephraim, Utah with the rest of the converted Scandinavians. He married a woman named Lorenz in 1875. She died six days after giving birth to their child, Lorenzo, in 1878. He married Josephine the following year in 1879. Unfortunately, Lorenzo died that same year. In the 1880 census, it has Christopher and Josephine living in Manti, Utah, which is just down the road from Ephraim. His occupation is listed as carpenter. While living in Manti, Christopher and Josephine had four children. Their youngest author, Arthur, passed away in November of 1889 and is buried with Lorenz and Lorenzo in a pioneer cemetery in Ephraim. I did find a newspaper article about Christopher from 1897, and it states that his floral business was established in 1882. So it looks like he became a florist before he while he was living in Manti before he came to Salt Lake. The first mention of Christopher in Salt Lake City was in 1887. A newspaper article from April of that year states that he petitioned the city council to allow him to maintain a floral stand on Main Street each Saturday. In the petition, Christopher stated that he had no other means of livelihood except to sell his flowers. Now, I couldn't find any more information on if the petition was granted or not. But we do know that in 1890, he had a house built on a mid-block street in downtown Salt Lake City. The top floor was the living quarters for him and his family, and the bottom level served as his floral shop. The house didn't have an exact address when it was built. Newspaper articles from 1890 listed the address as Park Avenue Entrance East 2nd South Street. And then from the article I read at the beginning, I guess it was also called Busby's Avenue. But in 1891, the street would be named Floral Street after Kramer's Floral Shop. Hmm. So this house was um, built in 1890, right smack dab in the middle of the Victorian era, which 
um, is shown in the type of architecture it is. It's actually a Victorian error front, sorry, it's actually a Victorian error false front commercial. These were around from 1837 to 1901 um, during the Victorian era. This is a very common architectural style for the time frame. Uh, the goal of the architecture is to project an image of stability and success, while in fact a business owner may or may not have invested much in the building. And it's, some of these were actually temporary. Luckily, oh. the Kramer house wasn't. Yay. Um, the front of the facade of the building rises to form a parapet at the upper wall. You can see that on top of it where the white ornamentation is. That's the parapet. Um, and it hides nearly all of the roof. That was by design. The front of this building was really um, built to show more of like a stately appearance, right? right? And the back has almost no ornamentation. In fact, the bricks on the sides and the back of the building are most likely different. Oh, wow. Um, and different quality. That's how they were usually built. Um, the front ornamentation, you can see window arches and bricks creating divide, divides along the facade. And it's very common to see that on these structures. I like to call them, along with several other people, like the, the mullet house. The mullet or, house. Or mullet building, where it's like business in the front and party in the back. <laughs> That's totally this house. So yeah, it's interesting in that way. And it, it does have some other styling elements to it that make it unique. Um, it's a very pretty building from the front. So next time you're down there and you look at it, notice that the front is, has a lot more ornamentation than the rear and sides. And also, if you want to see more of these types of buildings, I highly rec recommend going and seeing Ogden's 25th Street because there's a ton of Victorian era false front commercials there. So you can see the Victorian era mullet houses or in buildings on, yes. <laughs> on 24, 25th Street, 24th Street? 25th Street. 25th yeah. Street in Ogden. There you go. Yeah. And there, it's once you see that you recognize it from then on. Like once you, you can definitely notice a difference between the front of the building and the side and the back. Yeah, yeah, a lot of these buildings were built so close to each other, they maybe have had like all alleyways between them just to get the back and that's it. But most people walked on the front road in front of them or the sidewalk in front of them, so they never really saw. That was the most important thing is yeah. to see that your building looked fantastic from the front and didn't really matter what was going on in the back. Yes. Yes. Kind of like a mullet. <laughs> <laughs> so um, with this house being in the city, uh, there's the question of where did Christopher grow his flowers? I checked the Sanborn Fire insurance maps and the 1889 map shows a glass greenhouse labeled C. Kramer Floral Establishment conveniently located right next to the house. So that's pretty cool that he had his own greenhouse right there. Christopher and Josephine lived in the house with their five children. The couple had three additional children that did not survive birth. I can't imagine living, so that's five, that's seven people all in the upstairs. This house isn't that big. No, it's not a very big building. Seven all living on the top floor together. Yeah, couldn't imagine. No. But... <laughs> So just seven years later in 1897, Christopher transferred the deed of the house to E.F. Crandall for $1. And he moved his business to the basement of the Walker Bank building at the corner of Main Street and 2nd South and relocated his family to what was then known as the outskirts of town at around 15th South and 13th East. There he had two and a half acres of land with a house and seven large greenhouses. And I found a really cool picture showing his greenhouses. And I believe it's his house and we'll post that on social so people can see that. According to Christopher's obituary, he ran his floral business until 1924 when he retired. Now here's a bit of Kramer family drama. So it's always fun to to delve into what was going on in the family, right? And this is very interesting. I don't know how you recover from this as a family. I don't either. In 1908, Christopher's sons, his oldest sons, Ernest and Bernard, bought, brought a suit against their father in district court claiming that he had not been that they had not been given their fair share of the profits from the floral business. A year prior, the three had formed a partnership called the Kramer Floral Company. The boys claimed their father had refused a request to inspect the accounting books and refused to turn over their share of the profits from the $5,121.65 the business brought in since the start of the partnership. Christopher countered, stating that his boys had both drawn more money 
out of the account than they were entitled to, and that Ernest actually owed him over $140. He also stated that the boys had received their fair share, and the stock in his company had actually gone down since the partnership was formed. Now, to add more fuel to this fire around the same time, Christopher brought a suit against Ernest to evict him from a house in another part of the city. Christopher claimed his son was trespassing on the property he owned and caused $100 in damages. Now, I'm not sure what happened with the eviction, but the suit was eventually dropped. But I agree with you, Chris. I don't know how you recover from that as a family. That's some pretty big, big stuff going on. According to Bernard's obituary, he retired from Utah Oil Refinery Company, and newspaper articles show Ernest went into mining, although his death certificate does list his profession as a florist. It almost seems like they didn't recover from it. He had moved on. Maybe, yeah. By 1911, Floral Street was full of houses and businesses. Eventually, a few of the small buildings across the street from Kramer House became incorporated into larger buildings. With these buildings using Floral Street as their rear entrances, the use of the street became a lot more commercial. And throughout the years, families and individuals continued to live in the few remaining houses that were there. And for a time, there was at least one brothel on Floral Street. Now that's documented. I found a story that alluded to the Kramer House itself being a brothel, but I could not find any evidence of that story. And since this house was always occupied by families, I kind of doubt that. Yeah, it could also just be a rumor based on people knowing there was a brothel down there and confusing it with the Kramer house, which happened a lot in history. Right. And there was a lot of other mid-city blocks that, yes, in fact, did have brothels on them. And so it might have also just been putting that same narrative on Floral House that happened on, like, Regent Street and Commercial Street. Yeah, it might be a a story of a larger issue with putting that narrative on downtown spaces. Right. um, Which happened a lot back then. Still happens today with certain parties. Yes, it does. (laughs) According to the National Register of Historic Places application for the Kramer House, it was owned by three different families from 1897 to 1944. However, in doing my research, I did find a few real estate transfers in the digital newspapers that showed it could have been owned by up to six other people during that time. But at that same time, this larger lot was also divided throughout the years and divided into smaller parcels and were sold off to various people. So that could also be why it's showing that possibly Kramer House was owned by more than just the people in the National Register. And eventually the, the land just came down to the one lot that Kramer House sits on now. In 1944, Zion Savings Bank purchased the house and owned it until 1958, when it was sold to George and Britta Nilsson for $3,900. The Nilsson's family were immigrants from Sweden, and in an article from the Solid Tribune in 1991, their daughter Lena talked about playing on the roof in the fire escape because there wasn't really any other place to play. But they didn't feel like they were missing out. Um, Apparently, Lena loved living in the house, and she stated that if she had her way, she would still be living there today. I love that story because it illustrates place attachment with historic places. And it also illustrates that, you know, you don't need a big yard to make a place special, that memories are formed through other interactions with it. And her um, playing on the roof or in the fire escapes are probably what helped her form that place attachment to it. It's stuff that she really appreciated and loved. Right. So um, somewhere along the way, the house was divided into an apartments because that same article um, that Lena stated she would still love to live in the house. Uh, The article states that the second floor of the house had four studio apartments, all with a shared bath. And at this time, the rent for these studios was $140 a month. I'd take it. Right. (laughs) Uh, In the late 80s, when the Center Theater that used to live on the corner of State Street and 3rd South was slated to be demolished and replaced with the really unfortunate skyscraper that still stands there today, uh, the people of Floral Street faced the closure of the south end of the street. Uh, This did not go well with many of them because... 
not only the people that live there, but the businesses protested that the closure would affect their business. So it looks like there was a compromise made. And when the skyscraper was built, instead of making the street a dead end, they changed the direction of Floral Street to curve to the east so it was joined with Edison Street. And that's how it is today. So the Kramer House is one of only two original single-family residences still standing in downtown Salt Lake. And aside from its short stint as a radio shop in a piano warehouse, random, (laughs) it was always a residence. And from what I can tell, the only original building that's actually still standing on Floral Street. It was placed on the National Register of Historic Places in 1982. Now, in 2011, the buildings on State Street that had hidden Floral Street for so long came down. Yeah. And revealed Kramer House probably to most people for the first time in 127 years. That's when I came to know it. I used to work downtown, so I would drive on State Street all the time. And when those buildings came down, I noticed this really random, beautiful house just sitting there. And I would look every time I drove downtown because I was sure one day it wasn't going to stand. And I still wanted to see it every time I drove by. Yeah, and it really stood out, too, because of the color of it. It was red at the time, I believe, when those buildings were knocked down. And it, when you were just going up State Street, so I drive up State Street every day, you would you would just notice it. It would stand out like a sore thumb because it was a historic building in the middle of a downtown area, bright red. And right. there was nothing else around it. Right. There was just an empty space in front of it. And so I always looked for it. And I was, I, I'm with you. I was always worried it was going to come down. So the city actually bought this, sorry, the city actually bought Kramer House in 2002. And from what I'm told, when they negotiated contracts around um, the land and the building, in the contract, it stated that the Kramer House had to survive and it had to be put to use. So the city protected Kramer House, did a really good job at doing so. That's why it's still standing is because the city bought it and stepped in. Currently on that location is the Asser Project. It's going to be 168 affordable studio to four-bedroom living units and 20,000 square feet of commercial space. Fantastic. So that will really help reinvigorate that area and bring it back to having foot traffic and being sort of a living area again. Right, and for a lot that since 2011 has been vacant, Yeah. it's nice to see something in there instead of being the eyesore that it has been. Yes. Um, So I found this quote about what is going into um, the Kramer house. Who was ready for Water Witch Bar 2.0? The trio behind the 900 South James Beard nominated location are expanding downtown. A remarkable location, the hidden and historic Kramer house, part of the recently opened Astor Project. Listed on the National Register of Historic Places, the house was built in 1890 by Christopher Kramer, a Danish immigrant who ran a floral shop. There will be significant upgrades before we're, they're slinging their spirits. In the meantime, you can anticipate several other developments at the Aster, including a sushi restaurant. Oh, that's exciting. Yeah. I love that they released that statement and acknowledged not only the place being historic, but who built it and what right. it was. Yeah. It helps tell the story of the area. I agree. They're really embracing the history of the building. Yeah. I think they're... I think that's important, and I think the reason why that is important is because if you look at other great cities that have embraced their historic architecture and made it a part of a living, walkable city, it's better for everyone. Right. And um, more people want to visit and be there, and more people have that place attachment and that connection to place because of it. Right, and it's unique. Yeah. I mean, so many of the buildings downtown are not unique. And so (laughs) to have this historic building be incorporated into a new development makes it really special. Yeah. It makes it feel like we're actually starting to get something right. Yeah. Which is nice. We're embracing both. And I think you mentioned this earlier, but it shows you can have both. You can have historic preservation and new development. Yes. At the same time. Absolutely. There's no reason why you can't. Right. I'm super excited to hopefully one day soon have a drink at the Kramer house and in a toast to uh, Christopher Kramer's history and his memory. Me, me too. And I look forward to that day. Who knows? Maybe we'll record an episode there one day. That would be cool. Yeah. 
that would be really cool. All right. Well, thanks for joining us. And Chris, you made it through your first podcast episode. I'm super excited for what the future holds for us. Me too. All right. Um, make sure to follow us on social media because we post pictures of the places we talk about on the podcast as well as other content. This podcast was researched and written by us and produced by Mike Gillen. You can find us at Demolish Salt Lake Podcast on Instagram and Facebook and Threads. And also on Twitter, for however long that lasts, at Demolish SL Pod. <laughs> Thanks for joining us, and uh, we'll talk to you soon. Bye-bye.